book of 2 Peter, the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. We've been walking through Peter for a number of weeks now. We did 1 Peter. We've got about four weeks left in 2 Peter. And the title of today's message is The Road Less Traveled. Now, you may be familiar uh, with that title because it is actually named after a book uh, that became very popular. The book was written by Scott Peck and published in 1978, although it wouldn't become popular for a few years. It wouldn't be until 1983 that it really caught on, but once it became popular, I mean, it really took on. Now, I hadn't heard or read the book until 1995 when uh, I was going into my first class at the Community College of Rhode Island, and I took a psychology class, and this is one of the texts that they gave me. I was fascinated uh, by this particular book. In it, Peck argues that psychological and spiritual growth are indistinguishable. And what was unique about this book is that Scott Peck rejected the quick fixes that most books and self-help books tend to offer, saying that developing wholeness and maturity is a long process. It's going to take time and intentionality. He guides us through the topic of suffering, and he says that when we experience pain, which we cannot avoid, he says the pain of problems that we experience must be dealt with constructively. And he gives us some tools. He talks about things that we don't like to talk about today, like delayed gratification and the acceptance of personal responsibility and a dedication to truth even when it doesn't make you look good. And he talks about balancing the good and the bad and accepting that both are part of life and both have a place in shaping and forming you and growing you as a human being. The author insists that life's problems cannot really be avoided. And I quote, he says, problems do not go away. They must be worked through or else they remain forever a barrier to growth and the development of the spirit. So when we face a problem, we can try as best we can to avoid it or pretend that it doesn't exist, but it will pop up in other ways. Or we can choose to face it and learn what we have to learn from it. So there are always two paths. The road less traveled is actually a paraphrase from a line in one of Robert Frost's poems that he wrote in 1920 entitled, The Road Not Taken. And in it, toward the end, he writes, Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Human beings are confronted with and defined by the choices that they make. So the main idea of this poem is that the speaker is confronted with this fork in the road, a choice. And he must make a choice as to which path he's going to go down. When I first read the book, I didn't have any clue that within a few months, I would be confronted with my own choice, a choice to follow Christ or to continue on whatever path the world had laid out before me. Peter is writing his last testament. Second Peter is his final words. He is going to be crucified in Rome under Nero very shortly after this letter is written. And he says last week in the passage that we looked at that the word that we have that was passed on to us through the prophets, but from God, well, that word has been made more sure and affirmed by the life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he says after he departs, and he mentions in this letter that the Lord has revealed to him that he will die shortly. He says he's worried that Others are going to come in, and they're going to teach a different way. And he wants to give us a glimpse of these two ways and encourage us to follow the path that Christ has laid out before us. Let's go ahead and take a look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It says, But there were also false, false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth into disrepute. 
In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the righteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature and despise authority. The word of the Lord. All right, this is one of those passages where it's hard to say that sometimes, right? So we're going to get into some difficult stuff today, but I hope that by the end of it, we'll have a much deeper understanding and the truth of it will resonate with us in such a way that we understand the necessity of the two paths and of our choice to choose the better way. The first part that Peter gets to, where he talks about the way that is not really a way in verses one to three. Peter is soon going to be departing this world and he wants to faithfully transmit the gospel and to make sure that that transmission continues on down through the ages. And he says, just as there were false prophets in the times of old, right? He's talking about the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament that his audience would have been familiar with. He says, well, there's going to be false teachers that will make their way in among you as well and introduce heresies. The word here translated heresies is the Greek word pseudo didaskaloi. Pseudo, false, didaskaloi, teachings. Peter was right. The early church did contend with heresies. There were the Arianists who said that Jesus wasn't really God, but rather he was the first of all of God's creations. This is our modern day Jehovah's Witnesses who are still carrying this early ancient message that deviated from the original. And then there was the docetist who said that Jesus wasn't really human. He only appeared to be human from the Greek word doceo, which means to seem. And they went in the other direction saying it would have been below God to become human. So it seemed like he was human. He had the appearance of humanity, but he wasn't actually human because that would be below God. And then there were the Gnostics who believed that it was secret wisdom and knowledge that saved you. So they also followed the teachings of Jesus, but by the time they were done with them, I mean, they were really something else. They believed that Jesus was teaching things that, and there was these deep hidden messages in there that only select people could really understand. And if you would have seen some of their their translations and their interpretations, they were very different from anything that it seemed like Jesus was saying at all. But that's why it was a secret wisdom and a secret knowledge. And then there was the Sibelianists who said Jesus is God, but we know from the Old Testament that there's only one God. And so they said Jesus is God. He's God the Father. He's God the Son. He's God the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, he's God the Father. In New Testament times when he walked on earth, he's God the Son. But after the resurrection, he becomes God the Spirit, and the three do not exist at once. There is no relationship. Today we call this modalism. And it still exists in things like apostolic Pentecostalism, which still is around today. Peter says, now, there are some who intentionally deceive. Verse 3, he points out one of the main motives. He says, greed. Now, we don't need to look too far to see this today. Just turn on your television and someone will say, if you send in $999 right now, The floodgates of heaven are going to be open and it's going to be multiplied tenfold. Send in your $999 as your seed offering. And there are those who make up stories. Sometimes they plant people in the audience in order to pretend a healing. And then there are real stuff that happens as well. 
And then there are people who overemphasize any particular theology, which has truth to it, like faith and healing. But sometimes they go too far and saying, if you just believe hard enough, then whatever it is that you're dealing with, you don't ever have to be sick. And they want to believe this. And they believe that they can't doubt it and they can't make any sort of, any sort of utterance that might seem to undermine it. Otherwise, it might take away from their possible healing. When Carla was working in Minneapolis, she worked at a group home for developmentally disabled adults. And as she worked there, she found out that the boss, uh, the founder of these homes, um, had been a Christian. And this was his story. He had been a Christian, and he and his wife had a difficult time conceiving. Uh, they did finally give birth to a son, and their son had a developmental disability. Well, they were going to a church at the time that believed this, that if you just believe hard enough, if you have enough faith, they said, your son, God will heal him of this developmental disability. And you can already see the path this is going to go. And so they did everything they could. They followed all the advice they could. They tried really hard to believe and to not doubt. And it broke their hearts and it ruined their faith. And they eventually left the church. And they left following Christ and following God. But something good did develop from it. And that is they had a love for their son and they wanted the very best for him. And not only for him, but for others who had developmental disabilities. And now in Minnesota, they have multiple homes because they started with one and kept multiplying them for all different levels of care so that others who had loved ones, who had developmental disabilities, could one day move out of their houses and live as independently as possible, having as much freedom and independence and yet be in a safe place where their needs would be taken care of and they would be able to enjoy and engage with others and do things that really drew them in and helped them to have the abundant life that Christ wanted for them. When we left Minneapolis, he hadn't yet converted back to Christianity, but I believe God was doing a work. And so we'll continue to believe that in this way, he'll see that God was leading him in it. You know, most false teaching arises from sincere people. They so badly want their vision of the gospel to be true. So they contort the gospel to fit their agenda, and they feel really good and really right about it. There is a saying that I'm sure you've heard, and it is disturbing, but I think that it captures the heart of what we're talking about when we talk about how things sometimes come wrapped up, looking right, but maybe for all the wrong reasons. And the saying is this, when fascism comes to America, it will be wrapped in the flag and carrying a cross. It's a scary thought, isn't it? The idea is that destructive teaching usually comes wrapped in something familiar to us, something that we resonate with, something that we desire, something that we consider good and reasonable and maybe even common sense. The problem is, Underneath it all, it's usually very self-centered. It then takes over as the main drive and focus of our lives. And we believe that as we pursue it, that we've got God's blessing in it. And we begin to pursue something other than God. Jesus said it like this, one day people will persecute you and put you to death and believe that they're doing God a favor. False teaching offers a way that is not really a way. There are many options before us, but there is really only two paths. Verses 4 through 8, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In early Christianity, Christianity was actually known as the way. You see it in the book of Acts. Believers were called followers of the way. But there is another way, which is not a way at all. And the Proverbs talk about this when it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. Apparently, men aren't the only ones who get it wrong along the way or who get lost along the way. Some of the angels lost their way too or went their own way and they ended up in hell 
Well, not exactly, because there's really no such thing as hell. I thought that might get your attention. But before you rob bell me out of here, you notice how I use that as a uh, verb, I'll tell you what I mean. The word hell has its own history. Benjamin Corey describes it like this. He says, the word hell becomes a prime example. Can you go ahead to the next slide? You can follow along there. The word hell becomes a prime example. The word we use today doesn't actually appear in language until approximately 725 AD, long after the first century. In addition, the word doesn't come from Hebrew at all, but rather is ultimately rooted in Proto-Germanic According to the Barnhart Concise Dictionary of Etymology, the word hell was adopted into our vocabulary as a way to introduce the pagan concept of hell into Christian theology, which it did quite successfully. So here's a good example of this. Uh, nearing the time of Jesus' death, he takes his disciples to the north of Galilee. So he takes them up to a town, which is known in Jesus' time as Caesarea Philippi. And in that town, Jesus begins teaching his disciples, one, that he's going to die soon, but talks about some other things as well. What's interesting about this town that Jesus talks to Peter about and, and speaks about how the gates of hell are not going to be able to prevail against the rock that God is, is founding, is that there was a rock already there. In this region, there was a cave. This region used to be called Panias. And the reason why it was called Panias, uh, sometimes called Bunias uh, over time, but it actually started with the word Pan. Pan was a Greek deity. And so in this place, there are all these sacred, all these sacred um, temples that will be constructed that we'll show you in a minute. You see a cave there, and what you are seeing are the archaeological remains of an excavated site uh, that you'll see in a little while uh, there were different temples in this area. Flowing out of this cave used to be a spring. In fact, this is the headwaters of the Jordan River. And in this place, when they saw that the spring was flowing quite wide and gushing, uh, they decided that this is a very sacred place. And so they set up these temples there. That spring is still going today, but an earthquake has changed its route. At this site, it was dedicated to the god Pan. Pan, uh, you may not have heard about him, but you know more than you think about him. If you've ever seen a picture of the devil with horns and a tail, it's actually a description of Pan. Our modern day description of the devil that you'll see as a cartoon character is actually coming from the god Pan. That's what Pan looked like. He was a god who was associated with goats, and that's why he had the horns. In fact, he had some goat legs, and he had a tail, and he was worshipped in this site. This is me in front of that cave. Uh, I was surprised. You know, I had come with shorts and a t-shirt thinking that uh, the gate to hell, uh, because that's what this was, they believed that it was the gate to Hades and the underworld. I thought it was going to be a little bit warmer even in January. I had to borrow some clothes from some friends. A little different than what I thought. In the first century BC, Herod the Great built a temple here and built up the whole area. And this temple, here's that spring uh, that you're talking about, it's still running, still the headwaters of the Jordan River, even now. You can go ahead to the next slide. Now here's what that site looked like in the first century. So at the very end of the first century BC, around 20 BC, Herod begins building this site. So in the time of Jesus, this is what it looks like. This first temple over here, this is where that cave was. It's built right in front of the cave, and you can see the water flowing out from underneath it. This is a temple that Herod built and that he dedicated to Augustus, the Caesar. Here is a temple to Zeus. And then here is the temple to Pan. So in this area, which becomes a sacred space, Jesus brings his disciples. After Herod's death, this site went to his son Philip, and it got renamed from Panias to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea after Caesar, Philippi after yours truly, Herod's son, Philip. Now, it was still believed in the time of Jesus that behind this temple where the mouth of this cave opened was the entrance to the underworld known as Hades. And it was ruled by a god whose name also was Hades. And it is here that Jesus turns to Peter 
And he says to him in Matthew 15, 18, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The rock is the confession that Peter had just said when Jesus had asked, who do men say I am and who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. The rock is that confession. And on this rock, on this faith, Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, which means all the pagan worship you see, Augustus and Herod and all those rulers and all the gods of hell will not stop the gospel from going forward. A prophecy which has certainly been fulfilled in our day. Who remembers Hades or Pan anymore? But the name of Jesus Christ is known in all places. But the word used in our second Peter passage is actually not Hades. In English, it is translated in most translations as hell, but literally it's a Greek word Tartarus. What is Tartarus? Tartarus is another Greek concept. You see, there's Hades, and that is one level, but Hades was not a place of torment. It was simply the underworld where the dead went. The Jewish people had a concept like this as well. They used to call it Sheol in the Old Testament. But very deep and far below Hades, there was another place called Tartarus. And Tartarus is where we get our modern day understanding of hell from. It was a place of torment and punishment, a place of shackles and chains where you could not escape from. Where this idea came from was that when the Olympian gods came like Zeus and all those who would live on Mount Olympus, they were the new gods of the time. And they battled with the old gods of the time, which were called the Titans. And the Titan gods were overthrown and the Olympian gods cast them into Tartarus, where they were held and bound even to this day and where they were tormented. And so Peter is talking to a mixed audience of Jewish and Greek Roman people who understand this understanding and vision of Tartarus. And he's using this language to describe something uh, that overlaps with a Jewish concept that not all Jews believed at the time, but that many did. The first century, the Jews borrowed this imagery to describe what they believed happened in Genesis 6, where they believed that fallen angels called the sons of God corrupted humanity and that these fallen angels were sent into prison or a Tartarus-like confinement until the day of judgment. And so Peter is using this word Tartarus to be able to give us an image of a concept that is going around in Judaism during his time. The term Hades is used 10 times in the Bible. The term Tartarus is just used once right here in our passage. But the Jews also had come up with their own image for hell. And it's the most common word that's translated hell in our Bible, because remember, the word hell isn't actually in our Bible. That comes somewhere around 700 and some odd AD. But we have a few words that we translate as hell. The most common word in our Bible that is translated hell is the word Gehenna. And it's a Hebrew word. It occurs 12 times, and 11 of those times are times when Jesus uses it. What's interesting about Gehenna is that it's an actual place next to Jerusalem. Gehenna literally means the sons of Hinnom. And there is a valley in Jerusalem on the south side called the Hinnom Valley. In Jesus' day, it was called Gehenna. The valley is still there today. So here is a picture of first century Jerusalem. Here is the temple. This is the eastern side. Over here would be the Mount of Olives. Here is the southern side. This is Gehenna or the Hinnom Valley. Kurt Willems describes it like this. He says, This location is referenced throughout the Old Testament and is a valley outside of Jerusalem. It was a place of bloodshed, sometimes child sacrifice, that eventually was used to destroy dead bodies. The prophets speak of it as a place where fires devour corpses and the flames seem to burn nonstop. For instance, Isaiah 30 and 66. In this valley, the worms didn't die and the corpses were utterly destroyed. Some even believe that during the time of Jesus, 
This place became a trash heap of burning fire. We also know historically that when the Romans seized Jerusalem in 70 AD, they placed the dead bodies in this valley. Gehenna was a literal place of death and decay, end quote. When Jesus appeals to Gehenna, he evokes a literal place that Jewish people during that time would have been very familiar with. It's not the underworld, but it's a place outside of Jerusalem. Jesus typically uses hell within his parables as an image of something that he's trying to convey about what could happen in the afterlife for those who follow a way that is not really the way. The Bible uses the language and images of the people of the day, images and language that they would have understood in order to relate truths that we probably couldn't understand fully otherwise. For instance, in the Old Testament, it talks about the four corners of the earth. Now, you and I know that the earth does not have four corners, but the people of the Old Testament times did not. They understood the earth to be flat and to have four corners. And so when God speaks to them, he doesn't correct their science. He uses their understanding in order to be able to get at larger concepts. God will gather them from the four corners of the earth, from all places, and bring them together. Or God will go out through all the four corners of the earth and make sure that there is death and destruction to those who don't follow the way. Are there really four corners? No. But God speaks to us in the languages that we understand, of the images that we have. He speaks in our language. Douglas Moo, who is a very well-respected and conservative theologian, says this. He says, in any case, Peter probably does not want us to think of the angels as literally confined in dark caves or dungeons. The language is metaphorical. He is using a popular ancient conception of the afterlife to denote God's judgment. Perhaps the metaphor is intended to su suggest that God has restricted the scope of the evil angels' activity as a result of their sin. So the idea is, is that God has in some way confined these fallen angels so that they cannot be fully unleashed. And in fact, we have other scriptures that talk about this, limiting, uh, this limitation that God has put on angels. Otherwise, because one day when God removes his Holy Spirit from the earth, all hell is going to break out, right? Because the limitations will be removed. So what is hell? We don't know the exact nature of hell. And I think that it's best summed up like this. Hell is separation from God and creation. And it's not what we were created for. And it's not what God intended for us. And it's not where we want to end up. We don't even know what separation from God is like. Even if someone doesn't have a relationship with God, they don't know what separation from God is like because they are still experiencing God's good creation and the fullness of God, which is revealed in the glory of creation and the wonderful relationships that we experience here on earth. Hell is a place for those who have become a danger to society. In verse 10, it says, For those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. They despise authority. And we understand the necessity of such institutions, don't we? On February 2nd, 2014, Michael Elliott escaped a correctional facility in Ionia, Michigan. It's just east of Grand Rapids, nearby Saranac, where Pastor Stan, for those who know him, uh, used to pastor Saranac Covenant Church. When Elliot escaped, he was considered a danger to the community because in 1994, Elliot had been sentenced for the murder of four individuals, two women and two men. And so a red alert went out, and of course a search party went out. Somehow, somewhere along the line, Elliot was able to take hold of a box cutter and a hammer, and the first thing he did was abduct a woman who was by her car forced her to drive him. They drove as far as Elkhart, Indiana, where they had to stop for gas in order to continue the journey. She had an opportunity that she seized, was able to have her phone on her, which he didn't think to check in The Great Escape, and found a way to lock herself in the 
the gas station bathroom. Now, you know you're in a bad place when you got to use the restroom at the gas station, right? She was in a bad place. Elliot was pounding on the door telling her to get out when all of a sudden he heard her on the phone with 911 and decided he needed to get out of there. He took the car and headed out, but it wasn't only 20 miles east of Elkhart when the police surrounded him and he went back to prison. When he went back to prison, now this baffles me, right? He escaped prison, but for some reason he got his one phone call. Right? There's something wrong with the system. We know that. I guess because it was a new thing, going to be brought up on new charges, he gets his one phone call. You know who he calls? The Detroit Free Press. Because he wants to tell his story, because he wants to become famous. Does it sound like a guy who's repentant? No. He got his story in the news, and he also got 30 to 50 more years on top of the previous life sentence that he also already had. We understand the necessity. Now, I wish that we didn't need prisons, but some people prove to be a danger to society. Peter gives three examples of such individuals. He talks about the fallen angels, most likely referring to those angels that corrupted humanity of Genesis 6. He talks about the corrupt world itself of Genesis 6 and the humanity that had gone its own way He talks about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Each of these were determined to stay their own course, even though their course left a wake of destruction behind it. But Peter also reveals that there was another way open to them. And he says, but among them in Genesis 6, there lived a man named Noah. And Noah chose a different way. He chose good instead of evil. He says, in Sodom and Gomorrah, there was a righteous man among them, and his name was Lot. And he says, Lot lived in Sodom, but the corruption there deeply grieved him. And each of these chose a different path. And the way was opened before them. God made sure that they had a future. There are always two paths before us. Jesus describes the two paths in this way. He says, one is broad and it leads to destruction. And it's a self-destruction. Don't blame God. It's a self-destruction. And the other is narrow, he says. In other words, it follows principles. It follows guidelines that are good for society. And it leads to life. And it's a life that is lived in relationship with God because outside of relationship with God, we wouldn't know how to live that way. Jesus calls this the abundant life. And so there is the way of life in verses 9 and 10. It says in verse 9, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials. And it goes on to show the other way. And to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. While we tend to focus on the negative, like hell and imprisonment, quite frankly, it's rather fascinating. We want to understand it in some way. But Peter is actually pointing his listeners towards something good that they need to hear. Verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue godly men. When Jesus took Peter and the disciples to this place in Caesarea Philippi, at that time it looked like that was the way of the world. And it didn't look like that way was going to come to an end. And Jesus said, the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not prevail against the gospel moving forward. God's plan, God's way is going to be brought about. And nothing can stop it. And he's telling those that he's going to have to leave behind that no matter what it looks like, the persecution that they were experiencing, the discrimination that the early church was experiencing, God is going to prevail. And if you continue to follow the way that Christ has set before you, you do have a future, even as Noah had a future, even as Lot had a future, regardless of what the world around it looked like. So though the fallen angels are powerful, God has limited them. Though there seem to be no hope for our corrupt world, Genesis 6, God 
was able to save Noah out of it, and he created a way for humanity to move forward. And though evil still tends to take root in different places at different times, just as it did in Sodom and Gomorrah, there is a future for those who grieve over it. Jesus said, blessed are those who grieve now, for they shall be comforted. And this truth is as old as Scripture itself. In Deuteronomy 30, nearing the last chapter of the last book of Moses, just before Israel entered the land, it says this, This day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses concerning you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land that he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in Hebrews chapter 13, we learn that even that was just an image of another Jerusalem that's coming, a promised land that will be yet in the future, a land not built up, by the work of men's hands. And so I end today with that line from Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks, for you have not hidden this way from us. You have set it before us, and you have set your voice to our left ear and to our right ear, speaking to us, if only we'll listen, so that we will not depart from it. Father, we pray that you would give us the sensitivity, the courage, and the will to follow the way of Jesus Christ. That we might follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we know there are many other voices, but only two paths. One leads to you, and one does not. And Lord, we want the one that leads us to stand before Jesus Christ, your Son, and to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We long for that embrace. Help us to know you, even here, so that you'll be so familiar to us when we see you in that new kingdom, which is coming about. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.